Today's reading is from Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, and 8 through 16. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashores. All of these died in faith without having received the promises. But from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed. He has prepared a city for them. Word and words, O oh God, help us to hear the one among the many. Let us pray. Father God, Mother of us all, may the words from a, that come from my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. Amen. So first of all, I would like to thank Reverend Amelia for giving me this opportunity to speak in this pulpit. Um, Congregational Church for y'all showing up both in person and online. Um, I would like to thank Kyle, Jen, and Joy for helping me get all my ducks in a row this morning. Um, just a short introduction of myself. My name again is Britt Hicks. I am here with my fiance Radhika. Um, please say hello to us. It is good to see uh, some familiar faces. Uh, Anne has dog sat for us, so she's seen all six of our crazy, lovely, um, wild dogs. <laughs> uh, I am a student at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary right down the, the road from here. I am also a member in discernment with the United Church of Christ, uh, hoping to be ordained sometime. Um, and I am also a Navy veteran. Um, yeah. So, in 1989, one of my favorite movies as a child came out. Filled of Dreams. Has anyone seen this movie? Some of us might be too young. <laughs> um, filled of Dreams. My fiance and I watched it the other night as I was thinking about the sermon. Uh, filled of Dreams came to mind, which I, again, have not seen since I was a child. Um, and it reminded me also of one of my favorite passages today, which is Hebrews 11.1, 1, that faith is a substance of things hoped for with the evidence of things yet not seen. This is a passage that I can dwell on, that I can meditate on. Sometimes I think I know what it means. Most of the time I have no idea what it means. So in the movie Field of Dreams, the character, uh, the main character Ray, played by Kevin Costner, 
hears three different messages throughout, or three audible voices throughout the movie. Um, the first one he hears while he's working out in his cornfields is, if you build it, he will come. That's the, the movie's main catchphrase. And he thinks he's going insane because he's the only one that can hear this voice. He yells at his wife, Anna, can you hear that voice? And she's like, no, I don't hear anything. And he hears it audibly several times. Have you ever considered your sanity when you came up with a dream, a calling, a purpose in life? He's been given an assignment, though he's really not sure what it means. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. His wife and his daughter encourage him, while others say, man, you're crazy. You didn't hear anything. And it also reminds me of a literary tale that we're all familiar with in the Bible of Noah and the ark. Noah said it was going to rain. God told him to build a boat. And again, people questioned his sanity. And it also reminds me of the more recent version of Noah and the ark which was Evan Almighty, which anything Steve Carell is in, I'm gonna watch it because I love him. Um, but same thing, people tell him, mm, I don't think it's gonna rain. And he ends up getting all these shipments of wood, tries to run away from this calling and has to end up building this ark. Has anyone ever told you or questioned your sanity when you told them your dreams? I also think of Joseph and his brothers selling him because he told them of his dreams of ruling over his brothers. And as we know, the brothers sold Joseph into slavery. I'm an only child, so I don't really know what that sibling rivalry, rivalry looks like. So I don't really know if I blame the brothers. I mean, I wouldn't sell my sibling into slavery, I hope. But I, I don't know. I don't know who I sympathize more with. Now, again, back to Field of Dreams, Ray builds a baseball field in the middle of his cornfield, which was his income. This is the way he made money, was by harvesting corn and selling it. But the voice told him, build a baseball field. He spent his family's whole life savings to build this baseball field, and no one shows up after the field's built. Time goes on. Seasons change, and he starts to feel a little discouraged. Probably a lot discouraged, actually. Have you ever been discouraged while you were on a journey and thought, what was the point of this all? Why did I get all this education? Why did I waste all this time, all these resources? And then one night, his daughter tells him, Daddy, there's a man on, a on the field, and it's a ghost. The 80s loved ghosts. And ends up being a fictional baseball player named Shoeless Joe Jackson, who Ray actually thought he was building this field for. Now, Ray's dad always talked about baseball, and his dad had passed. And so he's kind of living this legacy of baseball through his, from what he uh, inherited from his dad. Now, Joe invites other players, more ghosts, who were all part of the White Sox World Series game, and they got kicked out after the first inning for throwing the game. When the players leave the field, they kind of disappear and dissolve into the cornfields, going off to who knows where, heaven? I don't know. Uh, and these ghosts have been given a second chance to play ball together. And a few of them at several times would ask Ray if the field was heaven, and Ray would just kind of grin and say, it's Iowa. <laughs> Do we create heaven on earth for people? The next message that the voice tells them is to go the distance. Have you ever set forth on a journey not knowing where it would take you? His wife, a little annoyed, by now says, Ray, this very non-specific voice you have out there, he's starting to piss me off. 
Have you ever been annoyed by not hearing one an audible voice or just having clear directions? Like, God, just write it out for me. Tell me what you want me to do. Ray thought his mission was complete, yet there was still more to be done. He thought that he, and if he build it, he will come, was about Shoeless Joe, but it wasn't. While Ray and his wife were at a PTA meeting, the people there were talking about banning books, and this again was the 80s, so they're talking about banning books like The Wizard of Oz or Anne Frank. And it's interesting to watch this movie and realize that we still have these discussions, but now they're just for newer books. And Ray's wife jumps up and defends the books and quotes an activist, again, this is all make-believe, um, Terrence Mann, and Terrence happened to be the next clue. So Ray has to travel to find Terrence Mann. Travels across the country to find this worn out activist who he knew from the 60s. He was old and tired and frankly just did not want to be messed with. He tried to drive Ray out with some uh, pest stuff like pest spray. Have you ever gotten worn out and tired in your purpose? This reminds me of Galatians 6, 9 that says, So let us not grow weary in doing what is right. For we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. It's easier said than done, right? So Terrence Mann joins Ray and they drive across the country to go to Boston and Ray goes out for a walk in the middle of the night and mysteriously finds himself back in the 70s. Kind of reminds me of Back to the Future where they just end up in some other time. And he finds one of the old baseball players who is named Moonlight Graham, also known as Dr. Graham. He was the doctor who dreamed of being in the major leagues and only to play in one inning Yet he went back to school to become a doctor, yet kept dreaming of just being able to play ball one last time and to be able to bat in a game. Did you ever have what seemed like a setback in life? You felt like you were destined for one thing, yet the universe seemed to send you into a different direction? Just like Graham wanted to be a ball player, yet ended up as a doctor? a very successful doctor, and he was able to help so many children. In a Chislam newspaper, the publisher wrote about Dr. Graham's in his uh, obituary, quote, and there were times when children could not afford eyeglasses or milk or clothing, yet no child ever denied any of these essentials because in the background, there was always Dr. Graham without any fanfare or publicity. The glasses or the milk or the ticket to the ball, ground, ball game found their way into the child's pocket. And Ray tells Dr. Graham, you know, 50 years ago, for five minutes, you came, you came this close. It would kill some men to get so close to their dreams and not touch it. God, they would consider it a tragedy. Dr. Graham says, son, if I'd only been able to be a doctor for five minutes, now that would have been a tragedy. Has life ever thrown you a curveball that set you in a different course? And are you happy with where you landed? Now, the last message that Ray hears is a voice saying, ease his pain. And this time, Terrence Mann also hears it. Have you ever had someone affirm your dream? How did that make you feel? Have you, have you affirmed the dreams of others? How did you offer them support? And what did it look like for the community to ease pain? This church here was someone's dream and they had to have dreamed it with a vision over a hundred years ago. They also had to have support and now we have stewards here that take care of the building and its people. I also had a chance to look at the church's historical website, which I could have spent hours on, 
for uh, the church, and it was neat to see photos from over 100 years ago of when the church first started, up until more recently, probably around the early 2000s. And it's amazing to see what the people that have come through here have accomplished, not only for the church, but for their neighbors and being a constant advocate for women's rights, LGBTQ+, and so on. One of the articles that I did get to read was um, about Sarah Bentley, who was a interim pastor here. Some of y'all may actually have known her and remembered her. Um, and she was here in the late 80s. And she and Rosanna Zluck, uh, who Rosanna was the director of the People's Community Clinic, teamed up and opened a clinic here in the basement. And Sarah said, this church is affiliated with the United Church of Christ, which historically has had a mission and a viewpoint which embraces wholeness for all people, particularly for the less advantaged persons, so our value systems as a denomination embrace health care. And it was kind of cool that when we got here, Joy was talking to my fiance, and she was kind of telling us the, the course that the church is hoping to go, and to see that the church is still dreaming, and it would be awesome to see where it ends up. But Sarah and Rosanna, teaming together with the community, they were able to ease the pain of those that were less advantaged in the community and around this community. Ray, through Shoeless Joe, at the end realizes that all of this really was for him, for Ray. He did all of this to be reunited with the ghost of his father, John, who was a catcher. And the movie ends with them playing catch. So the whole point was to ease Ray's pain from his father's passing. And Ray talking to Shoeless Joe, Ray looks at him and says, it was you thinking that it was to ease Joe's pain. And Joe says, no, Ray, it was you. Do our dreams help the pain? Do our dreams help ease the pain of others? Does serving and fulfilling our dreams ease our pains? What does pain even mean? Is it of past traumas and hurts? Is it of current worries and fears? Is it from celebrating a promotion or a child leaving for college, being come, becoming an empty nester? Not all pain is necessarily bad. In each place that Ray went, he was giving clues to the next place. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 says, For we only know in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. Now, after all these dreams of Ray's were fulfilled by the players from the past and also Ray's, what happens next? I know that this is a fictional story, it didn't really happen, but I can't help but think of when Ray woke up the next morning and having to get on with life. Maybe he had to find a new dream or help his wife or daughter with their dreams. Now some, like Abraham, as Hebrew 11 reminded us, never got to see God's promises fulfilled. In Genesis, it tells us that Abraham died of an old life, surrounded you know, by some of his kids. He didn't get to see his full promises fulfilled. Was Abraham okay with that? Would you be okay with having a dream and only being a small vessel in the whole picture? I guess another word would be legacy. You don't really get to see everything that you've worked for. Now, I love this story even more now that I'm older. And I love how relatable it is. In the movie, Ray is 35. I'm a little bit older than that. And how, again, how relatable it is, other than I don't hear audible voices, um, I don't see ghosts, and I have not time traveled. Now that I've seen the movie, now I have not, again, seen this movie since I was a child, but it's always interesting to watch a movie as, like the same movie as you grow older, and you've had different life experiences, and you can relate, again, a little more to each scene. 
Um, there's a scene in there where his daughter, Karen, is watching, again, one of my all-time favorite movies. She's watching Harvey with Jimmy Stewart. And it's funny because he, Ray looks and sees her watching Harvey and says, turn that off. That guy's crazy. And if you don't know Harvey, Jimmy Stewart had a best friend or had an imaginary friend and people thought he was crazy because no one could see the imaginary friend except for Harvey. So it was a little ironic. Um, and also when I was little, I had an imaginary friend named Harvey, might have been from that movie. And uh, to quote Mr. Elwood P. Dowd, he was a puka. Um, and also, so another thing was, and again, I have not seen this movie since I was little, uh, me and my dad, who passed away when I was 14, loved to play catch. So at the end of Field of Dreams, I was just a tad bit jealous that Ray got to play catch with his father again. I don't know if that was the only time, again, it's a fictional movie, or did they just spend eternity out there playing catch? Um, Side note, if you Google Field of Dreams, they still have the baseball field and they still do games out there, which is pretty neat. Bucket list, babe. Um, and in writing the sermon, I realized that I have mo I moved here exactly two years ago from San Antonio. I lived in San Antonio for 10 years. Um, and I had no idea what would happen when I once I got here. I was recently separated from my ex-husband I had just deconstructed everything I had ever believed in, and I had recently come out at the age of 35. My ex and a friend helped me move my stuff here, get it all into my apartment, tiny apartment at APTS. That was it. I was alone. <laughs> Went to Trader Joe's, bought a bunch of groceries, and I was here for seminary, and that's as far as I could see. I had fulfilled a bunch of dreams up until the time that I got here. One of my biggest dreams was I wanted to go to Nepal. I went to Nepal twice, and after that I was like, all right, so what do I do now? And again, that's when the deconstruction came in. Thanks, God. Uh, and for me, I had to start all over again, completely over, and rebuild my life. If you build it, I'll say she will come. I met my now fiance on a dating app, thanks COVID, and I would travel to, from Austin to Cedar Park, we'll say go the distance, and we now live happily in a house that we just bought with our dogs, um, with our six dogs, wild, six wildly different personalities, and we will be getting married in November and hopefully starting a family shortly after that. Ease her pain. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so this is heaven on earth to me. I would like to read the last few verses again from our reading earlier from Hebrews. Um, this time I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. Um, it's a little bit different. So it says, These heroes all died still clinging to their faith, not even receiving all that had been promised them. But they saw beyond the horizon the fulfillment of their promises and gladly embraced it from afar. They all lived their lives on earth as those who belong to another realm. For clearly, those who live this way are longing for the appearing of a heavenly city. And, it's, and if, their heart, if their hearts were still remembering what they left behind, they would have found an opportunity to go back, but they couldn't turn back for their hearts were fixed on what was far greater, that is, the heavenly realm. So because of this, God is not ashamed in any way to be called their God, for he has prepared a heavenly city for them. And to leave you with this quote from our fictional Dr. Graham, heaven is where dreams come true.